Here we are at the New York Auto Show, surrounded by German cars, American cars, and Japanese cars right here. And if you look right behind you, you will see the Mazda MX-5, which was the World Car of the Year for last year. It won two awards, design and the best car. So just wondering, what do you think of the MX-5? Well, considering that I owned one of the very first ones that arrived in the U.S., I think I had production number, so they tell me, of 802 or something like that. I'm a long-term uh, MX-5 Miata fan, and my only regret is that I sold that one. And, uh, and, and I'm now, actually, I was talking to some of my compatriots, and they go looking forward to see if I can buy it back. So, huge fan, always have been, and very happy to see that even though they did a deal with uh, Fiat, to, you know, because Fiat has the 124, you know, I'm glad that they got together because I do think that real sports cars are an endangered species, mm -hmm. and I think it would be tragic if uh, the MX-5 went away. So glad, glad they redid it. And while we're on uh, Japanese cars, we're just wanting to broaden the, the spectrum here and just look at Japanese cars as, as a whole because they're very popular in America right now. We're just wondering, what do you? Japanese cars. What do you think the popularity base for Japanese cars? Well, well I can tell you, number one is reliability, and that's been true for well over 20 years. I mean, you know, the when American cars were basically not considered reliable, hardly to drive out of your driveway, uh, Japanese cars. Now you're going back now to when I was much younger. Uh, back in the 1960s, they are stories where Toyota and Honda would be approaching dealers. And they would do things like open the door and jump up and down on the door and show that it would close well. Yeah, yeah. And that brought dealers in because they knew they couldn't do that with an American car. So they brought reliability to the American car market. But from there, they brought great styling, great innovation, uh, the ability to do um, uh, produce many vehicles on one chassis so you've got lots of variety. I mean, clearly the U.S. auto market would not be nearly what it is today, being a, a, a wide spectrum of very good vehicles to choose from without the Japanese presence. So be, apart from the top three biggest selling cars in the US, which are trucks I believe, the they fall on the top, the next seven roughly are, are Japanese cars, yes, and sedans I mean, and small yeah, SUVs and so forth. And, and, so you're looking at a very, it's a very big part of the American market, isn't it? For, for another good reason, as the Japanese were very, very smart to realize that to expand their market here, they had to design their vehicles here, they had to make them more attuned to American body shapes, let's put it, and they had to build them here. You know, most journalists, and I'm certainly one of them, that look at a Japanese car, say a Toyota that's built in Kentucky or a Honda that's built in Ohio, that's an American car. You know, it has American labor in it, probably had an American designer out in California. So really, I always say things like, it has an import nameplate, or it has an, you know, it has a, an offshore uh, badge or a parent company. But when you look at something like the Honda Accord, well, it may have more American parts in it than most uh, so-called domestics. As a matter of fact, many of them do. So we've mentioned the good side of Japanese right. cars, but on the flip side, are there areas of Japanese cars that you would like to see improved? Well, I do For think. Example, design, what do you think? I do think that sometimes the Japanese vehicles listen so much to their buyers that they end up making appliances. Mm -hmm. You know, cars that are really excellent engineering automobiles. You know, they're good cars, but you get in them and it's like, oh, this is so. Boring. It just comes you know? straight out of sight. It is boring, <laughs> and and I am very anti-appliance, and, and that's actually you know. But right now in this country, a lot of the young people coming up really are looking at cars as an appliance, so they're quite happy. But as a, an older member of the uh, enthusiast set, I want a car to have character. So I'm happy to see even sport editions of you know a refrigerator sport. You, know? <laughs> you like the, for example, like the Nissan has the the Sentra, right? which is a base sort of sedan, but they've also got the Sentra SR Turbo, which is... And they've now got the Nismo version, right. which is developed by the same guy who mm -hmm. made the GT... Well, that's looking after the GTR. GTR. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and you look at it, and yes, it is not a pure, we just did a review on it, it's not a pure performance sports sedan, but it's so much more than the standard Sentra, you have to give them applause because you know they're not going to sell that many of them. But I, I'm impressed, and that's another thing that impresses me about Japanese car company management. They're willing to, to, to take a chance on a low volume addition of a mass volume vehicle. They know they won't sell very many, but they know they're going to make the enthusiasts happy or whatever they go after. And I think it's important. I know you haven't had a chance to see much of the show, but of what you've seen, anything it's like, wow, that's really cool? I must say, I, I love coming to New York to see the, the crazy things that, that some of the manufacturers can do, like the Dodge Challenger Demon. I mean, taking a car to that level is just totally over the top. I like what the Toyota did in the uh, with that new sort of FT4X. Um, I like what Subaru did with their Ascent, the new eight-seater SUV, which is only for America, which is a pain for a lot of the people <laughs> watching, I'm sure, because they'd love to have a car like that. We have a Lincoln, I think. The Navigator. Crazy things about it. I mean, totally over the top. We're going to see that on the market very soon. And Honda. Mm -hmm. Honda have come to New York with a whole new idea, a whole new idea of a redefinition of the Clarity. Of course, the Clarity has been out with its fuel cell. Now they've brought in an electric version and a plug-in hybrid version. What do you think of that? I think they're smart because the fuel cell obviously will have limited um, sales because there isn't very much hydrogen available outside of California. So that's fine. They've done a, a very nice package and they have, along with Toyota and Hyundai, have shown that hydrogen powered fuel cell vehicles can be practical. But by using that basic chassis and then doing both an EV and more importantly to me, a plug-in hybrid, they've got basically a car for everyone and it's a real five passenger car. And I think that joins the ranks of, with something like the Toyota Mirai in, in that area, which is a very pleasant car to drive, but it's only right now available here as a fuel cell. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in the Clarity plug-in hybrid because it has an EV range of 42 miles, which puts it very close to the Chevrolet Volt uh, of uh, and, and as an advanced hybrid. And I think plug-in hybrids are what make the most sense for the most people of every all types of electrification. I'd like to ask you one thing about um, popularity of cars. In Japan, there's a word called kuruma banare, which means young people losing interest in cars. And it's a big problem for Japanese car manufacturers. They're looking for ways to get millennials back into cars, get interested in cars. What about in America? Do you see that as a big problem, or do you see it not really as something that manufacturers are worried about? Oh, I think they're worried about it. I mean, we've had talk here for the last eight years maybe about how the millennial generation is living in the city and doesn't want to drive cars and many of them when they turned uh, 16 they didn't even go after a driver's license. I think that's true to a point but I also think that's true along the coast and where the big cities are. If you get outside of that people need cars for normal transportation and now that those millennials are getting older and they're having children and they want to go where the best schools are which aren't necessarily in the cities they're buying cars. They're actually now the second biggest car buying group outside of the uh, um, folks my age. So I think it's changing a little bit, but without a doubt, they're looking at cars differently. And we were, you know, when you talk about appliances, they would be tending to buy a car more because of what it can do for them as a u utility uh, than they would necessarily as how it could raise their spirits or say something about them. But I'm, again, of the old school. I still think that no matter how much you say you just buy a car because you want transportation, you're still going to buy a car that somehow reflects your personality. Yeah. I still think cars are very personal, yes, I think even for the younger. Yes. In, in America, you have a lot, of, a lot of very, very reasonably priced sports cars, like Ford Mustang, mm -hmm. um, the Camaro, for example. And they're a lot of a lot of fun to drive. They're getting better. I find the Ford Mustang is actually a lot. It actually right. handles these days. Yes. <laughs> Before it just used to go straight. Uh, but depending on the version you get now, yeah. they're very good it's cars. And the way. new Camaro too. I mean, you've got the new Dodge Challenger Demon, which, as we met, as we spoke about, it's a car that you can drive from your home to the drag strip, drag, All right, and go back home again, and go back home again in the same car. Right. It's got about 840 horsepower with. The ability to turn, turn it up much higher up than much that, higher, yeah. run on race fuel. Let's let's compare, say, what 
the Americans are doing with the sports cars to what the Japanese are doing because the Japanese it seems to be a resurgence of sports cars. Ten, it's the tenth anniversary of the mm -hmm. Nissan GTR. You've got the uh, Toyota 86. You've got Lexus coming back with the LC 500. You've got um, Honda coming back with the NSX, and I hear another S2000 coming back as well. Right. Plus the new Z coming along. So what do you? How would you compare the different sports cars between America and? America? I think the Americans are still pretty much hung up on the um, the 60s style pony cars. We call them the Mustang, the Camaro, the uh, Charger or Challenger, depending on the time, and looking at those with the long hood and the short rear deck and the nostalgic aspect of them, um, sitting low to the ground, the old longer, lower, wider routine. And there's a, a core American audience that just cannot get enough of them. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it's spurned on by us in the media yep. who love to take the latest Mustang and the latest uh, Camaro and put them together. Uh, it's a relatively small market, but it gets people into the showrooms and then they may drive down into portals. <laughs> but they, but they, they tend to be, I won't say unsophisticated, but they don't have all of the electronic bells and whistles that yeah. some of the new higher end things out of both Europe and Japan yeah. have. So I do think there's a little bit different culture there and they're playing more towards middle America, frankly, uh, where a lot of the higher priced vehicles are looking at the more sophisticated urbanized. So there's room for all of them, fortunately. I mean, I think we have a, a wider variety of sporty cars available in this country than we've ever had. It's yeah. great. And what about SUVs? Do you think <laughs> SUVs taking over the market? SUVs, they just, it's, I see them everywhere. But, but they basically, everywhere. most Americans want to drive an SUV because they like the high eye point. They like yeah. the feeling of, of sort of all this metal around them. Is that, is that what it's all about? Here's my theory. Yes. I mean, right now, mid-size family sedan sales are in steep decline in this country. Even Toyota and Honda are having trouble. But what's happened is the class of sedan below it, the compact sedan, that has not suffered that kind of decline. Okay. Well, look over the last 10 years. They've gotten so, compacts have gotten so big, they're almost as big as midsize used to be. Yes. And midsize is now up where full-size sedans used to be, and they've always been uh, uh, kind of smaller part of the market. So I really think if you want a sedan, people are getting more for their money by migrating to compacts. But on the other hand, that midsize sedan buyer is saying for a compact to midsize SUV crossover, whatever you want to call it, I get the ability to carry tall cargo, I can put my animals in it very easily, why don't I buy that? And then you have the high seating position and, and the uh, just the general flexibility. We are flooded with three row, what we call three row crossovers like now. But they and, sell. But they sell very well. And uh, you know, even this year over at Toyota, the small, the RAV4 is probably going to beat the Camry out as their best selling vehicle this year. Really? Uh, in this country, yeah. So Peter, okay, just give me a capsulation of why do you think the juries picked the Jaguar F-Pace as the world car of the year? Well, I think overall it's the first crossover, the first SUV that Jaguar has built that really impressed the jury. I think also because of the design, it's a really good looking SUV when you compare it with the others on the market. I think it really has presence in the marketplace. It looks good. It's got some wonderful engines and gearboxes in it um, with that the three liter supercharged version and the eight speed gearbox. It drives well. It's got very good quality inside. Altogether, the total package looked good looking, drives well, good ride quality priced well. It's just a comfortable car that looks good and it looks good in your driveway as well. Were you surprised at the green car being, you said to me earlier that you thought the uh, the Prius Prime would get green car. Why was that? Because I have to say I thought it I thought it should have been the Bolt EV but then I realized that the world hasn't seen that car as much as we have. And you've touched on a very very good point there. It's all about it's all about the manufacturers. It's a, a world a global right. awards program so we need to get our jurors into the cars to be able to vote for them so to be totally honest the, the Prius got it because they were I think they were able to get most of the jurors into that car whereas the Bolt is very I think it's a very good car we had a quick look at it as well it drives very well it's good range a very high quality car but the problem was that I don't think they were able to get as many jurors into the car as possible so that's otherwise I think the results would have been a lot closer Still an impressive award system. Yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, you very much. You've yeah. uh, done a great job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay.